My name is Charles Harrell, and I am interviewing Ernest Cornwell. Mr. Cornwell, could you tell me when you were born and your current address? I was born July the 5th, 1919. My current address is 4001 Hazel Court, Fredericksburg. Mr. Cornwell is a fill-in pastor at Bethel Baptist Church and I'm a member there. I'm very appreciative for Mr. Cornwell granting this interview. What branch of service did you serve in? I served in the Army Air Corps. We didn't have the Air Force that we have now in the Academy and so on. It was all under the Army. And what was your rank when you uh, went in at the beginning and finally when you got out? I was private when I went in, and I was tech sergeant when I came out. And where did you serve? I served in Europe, out of <coughs> England. I was a flyer, not a pilot. I flew the top turret gun position, and what they called a flight engineer. The flight engineer entailed a very stringent study of the airplane that you were flying, whether it be a B-24 or a B-17, because so many things went wrong that some knowledgeable person could correct in the air. And the engineer, the top turret gunner and engineer, same thing, he had to be pretty knowledgeable about the plane he was flying in. If something went wrong, the pilot told him to do something or ask him what's wrong that we can correct, the engineer should be knowledgeable enough to know whether he could do it or not. For example, suppose in uh, it could be an attack by a fighter and one of the main hydraulic lines got hit by a bullet and severed in two. Now the hydraulic line force, it did just about everything. Everything but controlling the throttle. It didn't control the throttle. And it didn't control the ailerons on the plane. They were controlled with cable. But so much of that was controlled with the, air, with the hydraulics set up, set up. And certain of those lines, if they did get severed, the engineer was supposed to be able to know what to do to shut off the power that was coming through this line that was leaking, to shut that off and save the rest of the hydraulic system so it wouldn't uh, drain the whole system. Well, before you went in, when you were a younger man, were you interested in mechanics like that? In mechanics, but not of that nature, yes. Uh, where were you born? And I was born in Sperryville probably never heard of it, but I I worked uh, in the garage quite a little bit uh, those days before the war. And I had an appreciation for mechanical items. Who gave you that appreciation? The person that I worked for. I worked at the garage and I, I just picked up what he told me. I didn't have any training at that point. I didn't have any uh, technical training at that point. But I was able to pick up what he told me pretty easily, and he moved me from one position to the other. This and is his local friend, or uh, he was the owner of the garage, not a, necessarily a local, local friend, but just someone I knew. Um, why did you decide um, to join or enter service? I didn't decide. I was drafted, and I, I had to go. But I had no resentment toward going. I wasn't a conscientious objector, that sort of thing. Uh, once I got the final notice to report, I kind of looked forward to it because I saw in it, I thought I did, and I was right. I thought I saw some opportunities for me that I hadn't had before. And I already made my mind up that I would take advantage of all of it, and I did. Were you given an option of what branch to join? No, I wasn't. 
but I was given an option to turn down the Air Force if training if I wanted to. Did you have to go through any type of tests? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. I can't anymore describe the test, but you had to go through various types of tests. And, of course, the uh, oxygen, I'll just call it the oxygen test, they make you pass out, almost pass out for the lack of oxygen, so you would know what to experience, what you would experience if you got up too far and didn't get up the proper oxygen. They put you through the tank, in other words. Pressure tank, they called it. They put you through the pressure tank. So when you got your draft notice and you went to the induction center, Went to Charlottesville to the induction center, and two weeks later I went to Camp Lee. I went to Camp Lee on the 4th of, I went to the induction center on the 4th of uh, this September, 1942, and then I came back home for two weeks, 18th of uh, September, I went to Camp Lee. Before you got to Camp Lee and before you got drafted, did you have uh, any apprehensions about what was happening in the world? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Did you explain uh, some of your feelings? I felt very strongly in August 40, 40? I believe it was 40. When Hitler marched through France with the ease that he did and France collapsed, I felt like if something doesn't happen, if somehow the forces of England don't get some relief from us, Hitler is going to rule the world. That was my thinking. And it frightened me to pieces that he, the type of person I saw in him, I read the papers and I listened to the radio. And I pretty well decided that he could do it without the United States taking part. I thought, in my mind, I thought he could do it. And I still think he could. And you were about 21 when you finally got oh, in. Oh, about 20, 21. I don't remember exactly. I could count it up, but... When you got to Fort Lee, what was the first experience that, that you recall going through? The first experience when we got off of the bus that took us there. A corporal with a very harsh voice said, fall in men and pick up every cigarette butt that you see on the ground. All of us did like crazy but one. One person didn't do it. He just stood there. And the corporal ran up to him, right up in his face, asked him why he didn't obey his command, and he said, Corporal, he leaned toward him kind of like I did you, he said, Corporal, you have no control over me. I just got off the bus. I haven't taken any oath, and until you swear me in, I don't have to do anything you tell me. And I'm not picking up any cigarette butts. These people are doing it because they don't know any better. And the corporal dropped his head and walked away. He knew better. He knew that guy was right. I learned later he had served in the Army. See, he knew the score. I didn't. What else do you remember about your instructors at boot camp? Well, I got along quite well in, in, with the instructor in, in all of it even in the flight tests, but uh, in the basic, I'll call it basic, when you had to go to the uh, firing range, and when they set up machine gun, and they <coughs> didn't do this immediately, though. You, you had quite a bit of training before they did this. They set this machine gun up a certain height off the ground, and you had your pack and you had your gun, 
and this machine gun was firing over you. But you better not raise up because it was set to fire and your raising up didn't get anybody's attention. You were told about this, what to expect. And you got down, they were trying to teach you to move on your stomach, they'd say on your belly, and not raise your head or your hands, because you might get a shot off. Did you make any lasting friendships while you were in boot camp, or those first months? <laughs> yes, I, I thought they were lasting, of course, most of them now are born. I called one sometime, it's been a while ago. I called this person and he was in Statesville, North Carolina. And his wife answered the telephone and I said, uh, could I speak to Tom Coffey? And she said, junior, senior. And I said, senior. And she said, he's been dead for 10 years. What? But I was very close to him. What memories do you have of him and you getting along? Well, we were in the same barracks and we walked back and forth to the mess hall together. And we talked a lot about different things. He was a good friend of mine. Another one was, uh, I can call him by name, he's gone to Thomas Kohler, K-O-H-L-E-R. I don't want to embarrass anyone, but he was, a, uh, he was from Texas. And his favorite saying, when you'd ask him where he was from, he would say, from a land of fast horses and pretty women. Then he'd pause for a moment, and sometimes it gets reversed. <laughs> I thought that was... He, he'd do that all the time and just say, where are you from, Tommy? And that was his answer. From Texas, a land... Oh, he didn't say Texas. You'd say a land of fast horses and pretty well. <laughs> How long was your uh, experience at boot camp? Okay, from the entire training now. I'm talking about the, the advanced going to Florida to... Uh, well, tell us about Florida. Well, Florida was uh, the Air Force training. I was put in what they called First of all, they transferred me from wherever I was. I guess I was in infantry. I guess I was, because I took that kind of training. And then I was transferred to Barracks 12, MacDill Field. And I, then I learned that I was in, I uh, called to the office, and I was in the 20th Bomb Wing. Got a picture of it in that book there. The 20th Bomb Wing. And then we started measuring on flights and the airplane flying some, studying the airplane, learning about how it operated and so on. And Any particular airplane or just airplane? That was airplane. Then uh, overseas, as soon as we got overseas, it was a B-24 and a B-17. But in Florida, no, it was a B-26 and... B-25 and B-10 or 110 and that sort of thing in in the, in the United States. But these were training planes, trainers. Um, when you were in Florida, did you know you were going to become an engineer or, or an interrogator? gunner? Not, I'm pretty sure, yes. I'm pretty sure that I was going to say I'd, I'd go up with the plane, in the plane and I'd go up and uh, most of that, my training though, in, in the plane was overseas because when we got overseas we found that people like me were needed. People that knew something about the plane, something about the structure of the bomb, the bomb uh, group, the squadron and what it was expected to do once it got there and I was, I was pushed forward quite a bit. Um, when did you finally leave the training here in the States? After April, uh, after May the 3rd, we left Florida shortly after May the 3rd, 1943, and we went to Camp Shanks, New York, and that's where we got our things together that we were taking with us. 
And on May the 23rd, Sunday morning, May the 22nd, we got on board. We went down to the dock and got on board on May the 22nd, late in the evening, but not dark, but it was late in the evening. And we got on board the Mariposa. Now that was a luxury liner belonging to England, but converted to a plane carrier. And there were 7,000 of us, I learned later, that went over that time. And we left, the ship started moving, that I could tell it was moving, at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, May the 23rd. I remember that quite well. Um, of the travel across the ocean. Yes, sir. Can you describe your feelings then? Yes, sir. If you've never been seasick, you've never been sick. You've just been feeling bad, unpleasant, maybe discomfort, but you haven't been sick. And I can say that very, very, without any hesitation whatsoever. And I disappointed a friend of mine, and he showed it. He didn't say anything. But he was a few years younger than I, not much, but a little bit. And I noticed, I had noticed since Camp Shank, that he was all the way on the plane, on the ship, and even before. He tried to stay close to me for some reason, I don't know. But uh, he felt more comfortable, and he, he if his bunk got in, on the ship, if it got pretty old, put over here somewhere, he'd move it over where I was and put it beside me. And the way I disappointed him, he came to me, the, the gun, he said, what is that noise I hear? And I said, they're test firing the guns on the ship. And he said, uh, do you think they will sink the ship? And I said, I don't know, but I hope so. And he, he, he backed away from me after that, because that wasn't the attitude, that wasn't the answer he wanted. I didn't have any idea that sink the, sink the ship, but I was so sick it really didn't matter. Um, did your ship come under enemy fire on no, the way across? No, indeed. They just test fired the guns out on the water to make sure that they were working. When you uh, landed on the other side of the ocean, where did you get off and what did you do? Liverpool, England, June the 2nd, about maybe 10 o'clock in the morning, 10, somewhere between 10 and 12. We were called to formation, told to get on the plane, given a bag of uh, sea rations, and told not to open the cans until we were told to by an officer. I haven't been told yet, but I did open the can. And we went on, I don't know, I did remember where we stopped, the train stopped, and a group of the, I don't know what to call them anymore, but they were ladies of the, I'd say pretty much the equivalent to the Red Cross here, but they were British people. And they served us tea and crumpets. It's kind of like a donut. I remember that. It was somewhere in the late afternoon of June the 2nd. And we landed, we got off the plane, the train, we got off the train. I guess, is this the kind of information you want? Yeah. Is, is this too much detail? No, that's great. We got off the train at High Wycombe, England, which was a few miles away from the headquarters building of General Doolittle, who was commander of the 8th Air Force. And the officers, we had a lot of officers because a lot of them were pilots. But we, they saw a person sitting there in a GI truck. The GI comes from government issue, of course. And I will uh, talk to him later. And 
the, all of the officers, including Major Steely, who was our commanding officer, they got on this truck and told the driver where to go, I guess, and they left. About four o'clock in the morning, we were still standing outside of the station. And um, the train stopped and a major, major got off. And I won't use his language, but he said, in effect, what are you all doing here? And we answered almost simultaneously, we don't know. Where is your commanding officer? We don't know. When did you get off the train? We got off about six o'clock this evening. Something like that. And he said, fall in formation. And we did. This is about four o'clock in the morning. And we marched until about eight o'clock. And when we turned into this camp, it was the 8th Air Force headquarters. And we stayed there for, I stayed there for good little while, I don't know, two weeks, maybe maybe a month, until they caught up with me and got my record straight and saw what I was capable of to some degree. And I mean, I emphasize to some degree. And then I was uh, shipped out to uh, Cheddington Airdrome, English term, Airdrome, English term. Did you ever find out what happened to your major? Only thing I saw him walking down the street a long time after that, several months after that, all alone walking down the street, and I, I measured, but he never recognized me. And from there on, now you get, I've gotten to the Air Force Base, and I have begun to go up with uh, in a Piper Club to get the feel of the air, movement of the plane in the air. And not too long after that, I was assigned to a B-24. And this is a training situation. And all I'm doing is flying on the, the guns are there, but I don't have any ammunition because I'm on friendly soil. When you were on the B-24, you were at the tur top turret position? Oh, I was at that position, but I didn't have to. All I had to do was take care of the major things that might go wrong for, with the plane. I remember the first thing that happened. We got way up in the air, and we had been flying a good while. And the, this is coming on close to Christmas, 4 to 3. And the pilot called me, and he said, well, their answer, the way they would call on the intercom, pilot to engineer, pilot to engineer, if you're on the beam, come in, please. Meaning, if you're on the radio beam, he's calling on, come in, please. And when I answered, he said, the left wing, I just can't keep it up. I can pull it up, but it just keeps going down. And I pull it back up, and it keeps going down. And I said, sir, for whatever the reason, we have too much fuel in the left tank, on the left side. I'll transfer it back for you to the, on the right side, and I'll transfer it back to the left. And I was supposed to know how to do that, which I did, no problem. And when I got it leveled off, got to, I could look at the gauge, and it was a, Gas, it was a glass tube, had four of them, one, two, three, four for each one for each engine. And I could see over here that this one was way down and this one was up. So I just turned the gauges and turned the valves and what, turned the pumps on. I knew how to do that. And pretty soon they began to do like this. And I called him back and I said, Is the the right wing any easier to stay up. He said, it stays up on its own. Thank you very much. And then another thing, talking about knowing the plane. Um, the pilot called one time and he was, he was coming in for landing. He was approaching the field for landing. And he said, the nose gear won't go down. 
what are we going to do about it? And then we tear the nose all to pieces. It'll crash. It'll, it'll be a crash landing if we can't get that nose gear down. And I said, "Give me a few minutes, sir. I'll get it down." I went down onto the flight deck. Flight deck, and that flight deck is up here. That's where I stood most of the time, unless there was something going on. And the nose gear was almost directly under the flight deck. And I went down, and I saw what was wrong. It was it wasn't going down. Somebody had to know how to put it down by hand, and that's where I came in. I put it down and locked it in position. And called him back, and I called him from down there, and told him that your nose gear is down, it's locked in position. Don't worry about crashing; it, it'll hold you. And he said, "You're sure that you have it in position?" I said, "Yes, I am sure." And he said, "Are you sure you have it locked?" I said, "I'm sure it's locked." And I remember he had saying, "That's the kind of answers I like." We're going in now and land, and we did. That's the kind of thing that the engineer had to be able to do in addition to fire the guns if necessary. Well, after your training experiences and you finally got to combat, um, can you describe some of your missions? Yes, I can. It's now oh sixty oh eight hundred hours. It's now oh eight hundred hours. The briefing has just ended, and the weather officer has told us we're going to experience clouds over the target, and the squadron commander. Major Podawaski, squadron commander. Lieutenant Lorenz was the pilot, first lieutenant, and I was standing right behind him when the plane lifted off. And which is where we went exactly, I don't know. But we went out over the North Sea, flew over water quite a ways. Apparently it was an North Sea. And when the shooting started, people will say, well, nothing, I'm not afraid of anything, or well, what's that going to happen is going to happen. That's as, about the biggest false statement I ever heard. When the shooting starts around you, and you hear the sides of your plane breaking up as it's hit by the German shells, You'll be scared to death. I don't care who you are. Was I? I wasn't afraid of anything either until I saw what was happening around me. And when was this very first combat? Very point? first one is when the. Now after the first one, it's not too bad. It's not too bad after the first one. When the general in charge would be given, that was Major Steenlein, uh, well, Colonel Steenlein was Major and then he was, went, went to Colonel. Colonel Steenlein, when he was given uh, an assignment, for example, we're bombing, bombing the oil fields today, I've got a picture in there that, somewhere. We're bombing the oil fields next, tomorrow, really. He'd get the order today to bomb tomorrow. First thing he would say, how many seasoned men do I have? And what he meant by seasoned men, how many men am I going to have tomorrow on that mission that have been tested under enemy fire? Because you do things under enemy fire you don't do any other time. It's just something about it. For example, one time, the person, 
I can't call his name. I wouldn't want to anyway. When he grabbed the gun controls, his hands around the handles of the guns and the solenoid of those guns, it's it's in, it's in the handle of the solenoid when you pull the handle, pull, when you press that solenoid, so it it's electric, it fires. And when he grabbed that thing for the first time, his hand froze and he couldn't turn it loose and the pilot knocked him out. Get him turned it loose. So things happen on the enemy fire that they don't happen otherwise. Was this man in your airplane? He was in the airplane. But uh, he was, he had never been tested on the enemy fire. Makes a difference. I'm saying I'm telling you things I've never told her. I, I haven't talked much about my experiences. They were never that exciting, I never thought. Did you see any of your squadron's airplanes shot down? No, I think I knew it was happen I knew it had happened because it's no longer in the formation, but I didn't actually see it. Uh, a feeling you get that I'm going to explain this when I show you what I want to. I'm going to play, explain it. I hope I can find it quickly. Trying to find you a picture that has something written there too. I only can find that Eighth Air, Air Force for me. I mean that B-17. It's in. Uh, for example, when the mission's over and the planes have come back, when I first went over there in '43. The flak and the German fighters were so effective that a squadron of 17, that, that's what made up the squadron, 17 bombers. They had an escort a lot of times, but the bomber squadron was what really counted uh, when they came back. Uh, when they would park them on the hard stand, some of the... Well, out of a squadron of 17, Sometimes five would return, sometimes maybe ten, and sometimes none. And those that did return, when they would park on the hard stand, that's just no, no name of the place where they stopped the plane when they were, weren't flying, the medics would first come out, and they would pick up the larger parts of the bodies of the gunners. And then they would call the fire department to bring the water up there and wash wash the rest of it up. They'd wash hands up, pieces of the body that they just didn't pick up. But anything like an arm or leg, or large parts of the body, medics pick that up. There's blue sky all around it. And I tell you, it's laying on my desk. There's a picture laying on my desk if you want to get that. Anyway, uh, then they would call the cleanup crew and they would clean that hard stand up to where it didn't, nothing had ever happened. And they did this because they didn't want to influence crew that when they came out the next morning, or some of them would come out the evening before the flight, and they didn't want them to see what had happened to the previous mission. That was kind of, and the tail gunner was the one that really got that. The, my position was pretty pretty good. 
my position didn't get shot up too much. It could get shot up, though, because sometimes the German fighter would come in, that's it, sometimes the German fighter would come in over top of the, come, come down. This is what I wanted you to see. Read what it says there. Emptiness haunted ramps of airplanes that never returned. Now, that is how you would feel when your buddy was on the plane and it didn't come back. The plane didn't get back. It was just an empty feeling all around. Very, uh, I, I cannot explain what that felt like exactly. Do you know any buddies that didn't return? Oh, yeah. yeah. Of 120 in, in, in 20th Bomb Week. We got together the best we could after the war was over. And out of the 120, this is all we found. Whether they all got killed or not, I don't know, but they, they didn't show up. We thought maybe they would, some more than five would, would have died with five. Did any one particular one affect you the most that you were willing to talk about? Well, I guess perhaps so. Uh, one fellow affected me more than any because I had gone a lot of places with him. I was standing up for him, with him to get married in that picture. It's in my book. And he, he just, I don't know what happened exactly, but I didn't see it. And the thing about the uh, bombing mission, if you got through the flak, of course, there's no escort in the flag. When you get through the flag, the fighters can pick you up coming back. And they can escort you, which the P-51 was such a wonderful plane for that. They were the fastest one we had. And they were, they, that, that plane, I don't know who was flying it, but that plane drove off a you know, German plane that would have shot us down, I do believe, this P-51. Can you describe that incident and when it took place? To some degree, I can describe it. The P-50, the, the B-17 is just up there, just going someplace. And this uh, Frock Wolf, this German plane, saw him, the pilot saw him, and he headed right for it. Well, we were out here, but he, he, this P-17 was pretty far, I'm going to say, to 9 o'clock. That's the way I'm going to describe it. 9, 12, 3, 6. And this uh, plane was about 9 o'clock. The B-17 was about 9 o'clock. And the Rock Wolf was coming in at 12 noon, right over top of it, coming down like that. And I, he hit him. He hit him hard. But this B, this uh, P fifty one, he came uh, he came in behind this uh, fork wolf, and he did this to him. And he never stopped shooting. Gun was still fired. But he, he made a, made a circle around him. He had a faster plane than the Germans did. That that plane for the jets now. P fifty one Mustang. And he, he gave up and, and disappeared. What was the name, of, or did you have a name for the airplane you served on? One of them that I like to think of, I think I've tried to make my, my computer, well, password that, but they didn't accept it. Sun Boy. Some boy was the name of it. And I remember the pilot, he, when we were landing one time, he said, Radar 66, Radar 66. That's Edco, I can't pronounce the word right now. England, it was, it was a station in England. Radar 66, if you want to be, come in, please. And they answered. And I was having a terrible time that time. 
I had gone up in a new plane, and I didn't know that this particular plane would one set of generators would charge one battery, and while that was going on, the other battery wasn't being charged. And then you had to switch them like this and charge the other side, and I didn't know that. And one side went down, and we, was the electrical system in the plane started getting in trouble. And I didn't know that. It was a different plane, a new one. And, it was and when I found it out, I, I corrected it. And we came back over. But we landed at uh, Radar 66 was the name of the station. Sunboy was the name of the plane. The uh, you were based in England the entire time. Yes, I was, but not at the same place the entire time. We moved from now. The flying that I'm talking to you about now was done out of uh, Watton. Air Force Base, not Cheddington. We had transferred to Watton at that time. One thing I remember happening at Watton disappointed me a little bit in a way. I went to breakfast and came back from breakfast that morning and when I came in the barracks, the radio, somebody had turned the radio on. And Mildred Gillis, Axis Sally, was broadcasting and she was saying, Octum, 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 <laughs> attention. This is Radio Berlin. The flyers in Watton Air Force Base this morning had powdered eggs for breakfast and they were turning green around the edges. And she's in Berlin. And she's right. Was the food uh, okay or horrible? Or well, it was pretty good most of the time. I remember on Christmas Eve, I went up with a plane. They were having problems with it. I was having problems with it. They had an oil leak I couldn't find on one of the engines. And we went up for a good while. When we came back, the mess hall wasn't closed. <coughs> But uh, I went down to the mess hall and I had stewed turnips for my Christmas Eve dinner. And that's all I had. But a lot of us were like that too. Did you get to know any of these civilians nearby these air bases? I did a couple of places, but I cannot think of the names anymore. I really can't. The only one that I could tell you anything about was in Scotland. And she lived at 205 Ple South Pleasant Street, Edinburgh. I can tell you about her. She was a sweet little girl. I used to go up there on the furlough. And I went to see her a little bit. We had, I had some good times with her. She came to England, spent her, she called it holidays, after the war was over, she came and spent her furlough uh, vacation time with a friend of hers, Mr. Taylor's wife, by the way, the one that's in that wedding. She's in it too. I, I, didn't, I didn't know a person there at the pub, but I can't call his name anymore. I didn't visit the pubs very often. I wasn't in very good. I didn't very much. Did you have any friends that were shot down and captured and released later on? Probably, but I don't know of any. Several of them were shot down, but probably I, I, I don't know. Did you ever go to France or Germany? Uh, as the war neared its end before it actually ended? Yes, but that was a different story there too. It was a different situation. I was assigned for a while, a very, very brief time, with to a special plane with a colonel that 
was stationed at our base. And he was flying uh, missions and they put me on his plane and I had to maintain the plane and fly with him. And I remember one morning the weather was terrible. After we crossed the channel, he told me, he said, I can't see where I'm at. The visibility is not over 100 to 300 feet, that's all it is. So I want you to stand on a box, you told me where the box was in the back of the plane. And look out at this, uh, it's a plexiglass bubble is what it is. I can get my head in it, which that was all. And he said, I want you to keep your head in that bubble and we're looking for a landing strip that they're supposed to have made behind the German lines and we got to land on it. I've got very important things to take to it in this briefcase. They're very important. But uh, I can't see and I want you to look for that landing strip. I stood on that box hour after hour and finally the colonel said, come on back and sit down and co-pilot see if we're going home. And I, I said, well, what about our papers we're supposed to deliver? He said, we just can't do it. We just can't. We can't find the place, and pretty soon we're going to be crashing for the lack of, oil, oil, of gas. And we just can't do it. I've got enough gas to get back to the base. I'm going to take it. I'm going to save you. I'm going to save me. Do you recall when that was? Yes, sir, I certainly do. That was in the fall, uh, in the winter, just the early, early stages of the winter, uh, late 44, early 45. I think it was after Christmas in 45, before. But you see, we were really pressing the Germans at that time. They were on the, they were retreating in, in early '45. They surrendered in, on uh, May the 8th. While you were in service, did you keep touch with your family, and how did you do that? Well, yes, I, I did it through uh, what type of mail did they call that? A special mail you had to. You just wrote, just had a piece, you had a page that you wrote on. Victory mail? Wasn't Victor mail, I don't know. But anyway, you turned into the, um, to the, the, uh, post, the office. And the officer had to read it. And he'd sign it, seal it, and send it to you. There was a special name for that. And did you get mail from family? Yes, I got mail from family. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I had a brother, but he, he got out of the army pretty soon after I got in. But he was he was in service for a while. Was there any time that your base or your airplane or you personally were lacking in supplies? In what? In supplies. Oh yes. oh, yes. We were limited to 150 rounds of ammunition per gun. Lots of times, because we just didn't have the ammunition to supply. Yes, indeed. Was your job to make sure the guns worked, or just my set? See, two gu two guns to a turret, you know. My two, I had to make sure they worked. And the tail gunner, the ball turret gunner, and the side gunners, that was just one gun on the side, on each side. And the, we call it the nose to it, and then they put one under that, that was called the chin to it. While you were in the service, did you feel uh, a huge amount of stress? And at what, what would cause that? You're always under stress, at least I was always under stress, of some kind to get some, to make sure that something was right, everything was right, that I was responsible for. Uh, you know, the Master Sergeant isn't going to take the responsibility of anything as long as the tech, the tech is around. If the Tech Sergeant is around, he's going to put it on him. 
did you find that a difference in ranks really made an impression on you? Yes, I, I did. Of course I did. But uh, I, I managed to get along pretty good. I remember a plane landing one evening, and the pilot, well, I didn't know the pilot. He was a stranger to me. And he he saw my he saw my stripes, of course. He said, "Number three engine has to be changed, and has to be changed tonight. I want you to put an engine on that plane for me." Well, I tried to round up a crew of the mechanics to do that, but I couldn't find anybody that didn't have a good excuse for not doing. It. But you see, I there again. I had to be able to do that too. I worked all night long, all night long in that hangar, not a soul in that hangar but me. But before daylight, that new engine was on, it was checked out, it was running, and it was full power before daylight. But the thing about it was, when the man came to pick it up, the pilot came to pick it up. I got a picture of that plane, by the way. I don't know exactly where it is, but I got a picture of that plane. The pilot that came to pick it up was Colonel Elliot Roosevelt, son of the President. And he's the one that picked up that plane. He's the one I didn't know him at the time, but he was the one that told me it had to be changed that night. And I changed it. I was under extremely a stressful situation, of course, because the colonel has told me you've got to have a plane running, that engine's got to be running, a new one on there and running tomorrow morning. So as a flight engineer, you not only replaced things while it was flying, you also worked on them while they were on the ground? If the situation demanded. If the situation demanded is what I'm saying. Now, I don't know that everyone that had to do that, but I, I had that training too. I had the training for the ground. I had the ground training as well as the flight training, and that's the one reason. One of the reasons I was chosen flight engineer instructor. I flew with the, and instructed the, quite a bit too. Can you tell me some of the experiences of people you uh, you taught? <laughs> no, not so much as I taught, but I, as when I was. Uh, instructor. Uh, this fellow bypassed me all the way. And you talk about calling names, you got to have a reason to remember a person's name. This person was named Brownie. That was his last name. Sergeant Brownie. He had three stripes. And he got in with Captain Podowski, as I mentioned a while ago. I don't know how he managed to do that, but he did. He got in with him. And he got assigned to one of the flights as an engineer. But I didn't train him. I didn't tell him. He didn't come around me at all. He pretty much stayed to himself. But on a Sunday morning, when the, the mission's on its way now, and for some reason, I don't know what's happened, but something's gone wrong, and he can't correct it. And I get a call to come to the office and talk to so-and-so, talk to Mr. Br to Sergeant Brownie, and see if you can help him out of the situation on the plane. Well, got a call back later that it's corrected, and everything's all right, we're going on our way. But they were about to abort the mission because of it. I remember that. Did you have any good luck charm that you ever carried? No, sir. No. Never believed in them. Was there any um, entertainers or entertainment that was offered to you all while you were on base? Yes, indeed. Yes, they, they had uh, good, not too often, but they had pretty good uh, one time, Glenn Miller and his band, that was quite a treat. 
And another one I've kidding. I used to know that woman's name quite well, but she was there one time with the with the group. I can't think of her name now. Marlene Dietrich. She was there. <laughs> Finally thought of it. Um, yeah, they had people. I never saw Bing Crosby, but I'm sure he was over that one. Bob Hope, but I didn't see that. Did you keep a personal diary during the war? Yes, to some degree, but I've lost it a long time ago. But I did have one. I'm going to pause the tape here and put in another one. What is the most humorous incident that you recall in your four years of service? All right. I still remember this thing. I remember it in detail. The war was over, but we didn't get away for a while. I stayed several months after the war ended. I was kept there for whatever. The Red Cross. Now, we're at Alconbury now, not, not Watton anymore. We're at Alconbury. Still England. Still England, but it's Alconbury uh, Air Base. It's a base where Jimmy Stewart was stationed. In fact, he was sitting on the side of the handrail when we moved in there. When, when the first time I went down there, Jimmy Stewart was sitting. But he went, he, the war was over, and he went home soon after that. Went, went over, went left there anyway. Uh, the Red Cross, they had a a real good, I would call them donut, that sort of thing, snack, evening snack. And I used to like to go up there, go up there about 9 o'clock in the evening. And this fellow coffee that we were talking about a while ago, Sergeant Coffee, Tom, he and I were in this line, a long, long line, and he had a... a by word, I've forgotten what it was anymore, and I, I wouldn't want to repeat it anyway. It wasn't vulgar or anything like that. But uh, anyway, I said to him, I said, I'm Tommy, we've been in this line a long time, and I haven't heard you use your favorite uh, word, uh, slogan. Well, he said, I haven't had a cause to use it yet. I just haven't had a reason. And we kept on waiting. We were we were in this line, long line, long line, and it was a double line. And somehow, when the line got, when we got closer to the coffee and donuts where the counter was, when we got closer to the counter, it said narrowed down into one. We went one direction, and the other group went the other. And they would step on in this conversation. I don't know what it was about. But we never even looked up. And finally, when we got almost to the door to go in, uh, to the Red Cross, to, to the uh, serving area, almost to the door, he said, that slogan you were talking about a while ago, I can say it now. And he pointed, he, he, he turned me half, pushed me around a little bit so I could see, and he pointed to the door. And it said, ladies, restroom. <laughs> we had been sweating that line out to a ladies' room and thinking we were going in the, in the fallen line. And <laughs> mm. That's about the most humorous thing. I, I, I never got into much of the fun games. I, I was a little bit too serious. I had people tell me I was too serious. My... Uh, commanding officer one time. He said I was too serious. He's a captain. He said, you, you, get, you take things a little bit too serious. How did you get promoted from rank to rank? I don't believe I understand your question. On what basis did I get to... S About every time that I was promoted, I was called in and said, we have noticed First sergeant would do this. We've noticed what you've been doing, and we think it's time for promotion. I waited a long time. At one time, from sergeant to from corporal to sergeant, or from sergeant to staff—I don't know which. 
But some people went through the whole thing and never got beyond a corporal, so I considered myself pretty, pretty fortunate. I always, I always made it when, and the thing that I really, sometimes I regret it. I had put in a transfer to go to another squadron, and the squadron that I was going to was coming home. That's the reason I transferred to it, to come home. They were discharging with uh, people with 60, 50, 60 points. That was the point system then, and I had over 100. And I transferred to this squadron to come home. And I got put on what they call charge of quarters. Uh -huh. That meant that I was in charge of the whole base. This was state for one night. And I was uh, I, I was in the headquarters building, and I waited, and I knew this was pretty close. It was getting close to the time for the promotions to come out, and I hadn't been there very long. But I wondered if I was going to get master sergeant. I wanted to know that so bad, and the reason I wanted to know this lieutenant. Lorenz that I flew my first mission with. He is now all the way to Alconbury and he's colonel. Doesn't have a leaf, he's got a bird. And he came out to the hangar one day and he talked with me. And he's he's post commander now. He's in charge of the whole thing. And promotions are about to come out and come out the thirty first of October. And this must have been somewhere around the 20th or about that. And I was in charge of quarters. And I waited till the guards would always come around and check with me and ask if everything was all right. And this guard, he came around about 4 o'clock and I said, are you coming back anymore? And he said, no, you'll be all right. I'm not, I'm not coming back. Nobody's going to check on you anymore. If you need anything, you can call us, but we're not coming back. And that's just what I was looking for, him not to come back. I went in the record room, and the record drawer where the promotions were was unlocked. And I pulled that drawer open and looked all out the window. You see the blinds were down then. I didn't have them anymore. And I looked around. I didn't see any sign of anybody moving outside. And I got that folder out that said promotions. And I looked for Master Sergeant, and I was on it. But I couldn't accept it because I was going home. I was leaving. I didn't get it. But Lieutenant Lorenz, now Colonel Lorenz, I still see he remembered me from that first mission because I was on that I was on that list to be Master Sergeant the thirty first day of October, and the thirty first day of October I was discharged. I was on this side and discharged. In 45. 45. I saw you had some pictures of the concentration camps in Germany. Did you visit Germany after the war and ceased hostilities? No, no, no. A friend of mine made those pictures and brought me the roll of film and I developed it. Um. I. I still wasn't, didn't feel free to. I could, that, that was a free trip if you went over. The planes would go over to Germany. People would bring back guns and different things. I never got involved in that. But I still felt a responsibility because I was still assigned to that ship, to that plane. I was uh, assigned to the one when uh, Colonel Lorenz came out to the hangar. I was out there cleaning it up. What did he talk to talk to you about when he was out there? How how have you been? I hadn't seen him for months. And I, I didn't I didn't think he'd even recognize me. How have you been? Is that uh, is that plane all right? Is it going to fly all right if I need it? And that sort of thing. Yeah, it's going to fly. It's all right. That sort of thing. Do you feel like their crew was actually closer to you, to one another than 
just strangers flying the same equipment? In the air. Very close. Everybody was close. 40,000 feet up, everybody was close. But on the ground, it was just kind of business as usual. Yeah. I've had the pilot put his arms around me, different things. When things would go a little bit wrong, we get them corrected. Were you like on a first name basis in the air? Or was it still sergeant, captain, whatever? Oh, it was still sergeant, captain. I never got beyond that. They may have called me different if I would have, but I was uh, I was a little bit afraid to do that. I always called him Colonel. I went for the rank. Do you recall the very last day of you of your service? That I was in the service. Right. Yes. I'm going to recall two of them. Sunday was the most, this is, now it's uh, 28th, I guess. We landed the 27th, which was on Saturday, and this is the 28th, it's Sunday. You flew back? I don't know, we came back on the boat. Okay. And this is Sunday. And I didn't have one, I said it was the most leisure day I ever spent in my life. Certainly, since in the Army. It seemed like wherever I was, if I was just going to spend the night or something, that, five, that fifth stripe always got me to do something, to be responsible for cleaning up the barracks before everybody left or something. But this particular time on Sunday, I made one telephone call, and I sat in the comfortable chair in the, in the office there, and lounge rather than office. And I went to the mess hall three times and made one telephone call. And that was the most leisure day. I didn't have any responsibility. Nobody said, do this, or have you checked on this, or what about that? Nobody said anything to me about anything. And I didn't do anything at all. And where were you? I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then Sunday night, I went to Fort Meade, and this is now Monday, Monday morning, and I went to see a movie Monday night, tried to call home, couldn't call home, couldn't get anybody there, and so uh, a girl had promised me to meet me in Culpeper and take me to Lou Ray. This Monday, I was discharged, on no, Tuesday I was discharged, and I went home Tuesday night. And my mother had uh, dinner on the table when I got there, and I hadn't seen her since Christmas Day, 42, and this is 45, October 31st. Did they know you were coming home? Yes. What was your what were their reactions when they first saw you? My brother and his wife were at work and they didn't they knew I would be there about nine o'clock and they got there about eleven, they got off work and came home, but they didn't come home for me. My mother's the only one that really recognized me and I say in true loving spirit. And she had dinner for me and I really appreciated that. Do you feel like you physically changed in those four years? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Mentally more than physical. Can you describe your mental change, how you saw things differently? Not too much. I know one thing that I had some pictures that I had brought back. Don't know what they were exactly, but they were reminders of the war. And I put them up in the bedroom after we were married. And this was two, two years later. I put them up in the bedroom after we were married, and she had to take them down. Not nightmares. After the war, 
You said you got married in two years. About two years, I saw. Um, did you meet your wife following the war, or had you known her before? I met my wife on November the 1st, 1945. I just met her, though. There was no uh, in action, anything like that. I didn't know. I didn't have a date with her, I just met her. My mother had said that she, when I got home that night, before I went to bed, my mother said, there's a pretty girl next door that I want you to meet, my neighbor, and she's from North Carolina, and I want you to meet her. And this was on uh, October 31st at night. And the next day, she saw to it that she had me go over to the Mullinex house, which was just across the little lawn, and meet her. So my mother took care of that. But we didn't we didn't date for a good while. I don't know how. Did you uh, go back to work where you were working before the war? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I went to uh, Washington to the National Airport. I had a job with Capital Airlines, which was a regular scheduled airline, and I enrolled in George Washington University, night, night classes. Where did you um, get part of the GI Bill to do that? I used everything I could get in order for education. That's the way I used mine. And did you uh, live in Washington during that time? I lived in Alexandria, which was just across the river from Washington. When we got first married, when we were first married, we lived in southeast Washington. That was quite a place. Bradbury Heights, I still remember that. I don't remember the door number, but I remember that it was Bradbury Heights. Did you, uh, you mentioned before you had gotten together with the squadron one time and found out only five people showed up. Had you uh, tried to join any other veterans organization? Oh, I joined the, you know, it's not veterans of a foreign war, American Legion, but I'm not in it, active in it anymore. But I joined the American Legion. So do you feel like the, the Air Force gave you um, an impetus to go in with a certain career? I feel like the Air Force was very good to me. The Army was good to me. We'll just talk about the Army, but the Air Force, I got good breaks all the way. I never got a bad break anywhere in the Army, and when I got out, I had uh, opportunities like the GI Bill that I had not had before. And I, I said it was a good break for me. A lot of people talked about uh, what they all they left behind and so on. Well, I left my family behind, but they were there when I came back. So to me, the Army, was they were good to me. It was a good thing for me. After seeing war firsthand, and although I realize you were a, pilot, a, a flyer, um, but you do have strong emotions, I could tell, on certain issues. Yes, I do. Very. Um, what do you, what is your general outlook on war today? Unnecessary. Unnecessary, all the way. Is there any other um, stories you can relate to me that I haven't covered in this interview? You mentioned once about G2. And I didn't have any real experiences in G2. I served in it for a while, but I didn't. I was too involved, in, I guess, in my personal life as far as trying to do what I was supposed to do in the, in the plane, on the plane. And, and flying and so on. I was very, I was, I was really thrilled as far as thinking that I was going to fly and 
was flying. Of course, we did get a 50% base uh, raise in pay on flying, too. And all. Did you ever want to become a pilot? Yes, I did. And did you? I became a pilot, but not a commercial pilot. I wanted to be a commercial pilot, and I enrolled in flight school, and I got my uh, pilot license, pilot, private license. And I realized pretty soon after I got started in this that I was too old to get anywhere as a, a commercial pilot. This could do it. I was too old. I was 20, when I enrolled, I was about 26 years old when I enrolled, and I was 25 years old. And, no, I was, I was 26, 27, 26 years old. And when I was getting down to the real training, I had my license, but then beyond that, you had, uh, there was a lot of training beyond that, and I realized, the fellow told me, he said, 27, you out. If you can't make it for 27, you can't make it. And I knew I couldn't make it for 27, and I dropped the flight. But she took a ride with me. The first pilot, the first passenger I ever took up was Pauline. Um, did your career after the Army and what you did for the next 40 years, uh, did it reflect or did your Army experiences add? give you direction? To some degree, the Army experience, I think, would always help a person to see life in a broader perspective, and it did me. I think it did. Even though I went into ministry, and I, we have 48 years we've been together in the ministry. We over, well, 48 years in 2000. I retired. 2000 from the pastor. Let's uh, take a look at your, your medals now. I'm going to pause right here. All right, Good Conduct, European Theater, Air Medal. And down here, this is a, uh, I can't think of the name of the landing, but one of them was D-Day landing, I got two stars on that. Well, that was quite a day, more than just a day. And I believe the St. Lowe's one of them, landing in St. Lowe. And the other two, I just can't remember what campaigns they were. And this is my qualifying on the range, and he gave me a rifleman. And what's that top metal? Or oh, that's this. That's just wings for Air, Air Force wings. Gunner's wings. I think it said gunner's wings. I'm not sure. That's just a gunner's wing. That's all it is. Can you uh, describe to me how you felt um, at the, the day you found out, since we're so close to the anniversary of the D-Day landing? What a dreadful thing that is, that we have to take the number of men going into this. And I, I just, I don't know, so it's hard to explain that. Why do we have to do it? I know so many of us are not, I may be one of them, so many of us are not going to survive this thing. And I know the people on the ground are not. A thousand, I think it was nine thousand, that didn't survive the first day. And seeing these people, knowing these people were going to take off in these uh, uh, gliders, and they're very uncertain. I never liked them. I didn't like them at all, but they, they used them. And a lot of our boys, they dropped and hung up in trees in various places. And I knew that had to happen because of where, where we, what we were trying to do. And when I was writing something, I wrote St. Lowe. Well, it was in a church bulletin, I wrote something about St. Lowe Major. And the secretary, when she typed it, she put St. Louis. I was talking about a man, St. Lowe Major. He, I think we killed him. I think we did. 
Oh. Air Force. Well, um, that can happen pretty easily. You can drop bombs in the wrong place. The best way that I think I understood that when we were talking about what had happened that day, we were given orders to bomb just inside of the smoke screen. We're going to put up a smoke screen. And the wind, they gave us the wind direction. And the wind is going to be carrying the smoke back this way. They told us north, I believe, whatever it was. Bomb just inside of the of the smoke screen. Don't get over on the other side, but bomb just inside of the smoke screen. The wind changed, and we instead of bombing the Germans, we bombed the Americans. You follow me? I know that operation. Yeah. yeah. Now, I think the Saint Low and this major, he was such a outstanding person anyway, so I had heard, I didn't see him, but I would heard a lot about him. I know one fellow that was on that bridge at St. Lowe at the same time that said the Major got killed. I know personally one fellow, and he said the only thing he saw to do, and I've seen him since the war was over, was to jump in the river. And he said, I jumped in the river, and that's what saved me, and that's why I'm talking to you today. He lives in Ashland, Virginia. When did you realize that D-Day was the real landing, the major invasion? After it was over, all being left, it had started about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Did you fly on that day? No, I didn't fly on that day. After that day, but I didn't. I wasn't scheduled for that day. The, but I, it was Eisenhower was the first time I knew the D-Day landing had really started. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and I heard it on the radio, and I heard the voice of Dwight Eisenhower, and he was saying that we have attempted a landing on the coast of France, but they almost pulled that thing out and pulled it off and gave it up. Or, then they made. Then they decided not to. But they, they, it was a question. Could you tell that a landing was coming up in early June? I, I knew it was coming. I didn't know about early June. I just knew that we were going to land on the continent and try to take it back from the Germans. I knew that. But you didn't see any build up in, in oh, your base. Oh goodness, yes. You could see build up all over England, but they had a lot of it as fake, you know. Well, thank you for uh, letting me conduct this interview, and uh, I will know you for many years, I'm quite sure. Thank well, you again. You're certainly welcome. Thank you for selecting me. I hope I gave you something of what you were looking for.